by our very own Monsignor Dick Liddy. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Randall Rosenberg. Dr. Rosenberg earned a PhD in theology from Boston College uh, and now teaches as an associate professor at the University of St. Louis. He teaches courses in theology, uh, the foundations of theology, a course that I would love to take called Love and the Human Condition. I can't tell if that's a tragedy or a comedy. Uh, and the theology of the human person. Just two years ago, he published a book entitled The Givenness of Desire, Concrete Subjectivity, and the Natural Desire to See God. His talk today is taken from that investigation and asks whether or not people have a natural desire for God. And if so, what might that look like in its different forms be today? The title of his talk today is called The Desire for God in a Secular Age, St. Therese of Lisieux and Eddie Hillsom on the board there. After his talk, just to give you a, a sort of sense for how the events are going to go, Randy will speak to us, I assume, for about 40 minutes or so. And then our own professor, John Laracy from the Religious Studies Department, is going to give a response to him. And then that'll set some questions for us, and we'll open it up to the floor. For my students, anyway, probably for all students, if you want participation points, you have to stay through the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> so just to tell you how these things tend to work. Uh, so if you join me in a round of applause for Dr. Rosenberg. <laughs> I see you have a mean professor here on campus. <laughs> well, very uh, grateful to be here. Uh, I was here one time, and it was 12 years ago uh, to give a lecture. Uh, it seems like only yesterday, and uh, just had a great time uh, last time. So. I'm excited to be here. Very grateful for uh, the hospitality from Monsignor Liddy, who picked me up in the airport in pouring rain uh, yesterday. It was quite a flood. And of course, Greg uh, for organizing, and uh, Danute, and Linda, and uh, everyone involved in, the, in, in bringing me here. So very delighted to be here. What is it about saints or models or exemplars captures us? What is it about them that uh, awaken the human spirit? Such models offer a vision of the good life, capturing our hearts and imaginations, not simply by providing a set of rules, but given, give, giving us an image of what human flourishing looks like. After all, human flourishing uh, is communicated really powerfully, as we all know, through myths and stories and plays and novels. Why is it that we tend to be more enlightened by, is this Yankees territory, by the way? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Aaron Judge, or Simone Biles, or Carly Lloyd, or I'm um, from Saint, the St. Louis Blues territory, Vladimir Tarasenko, who I just saw the push notification is out five months right now for an injury, so I'll try to make it through the talk. Um, <laughs> but what is it about people and, and those who are excellent uh, at their craft, who have the kind of mental stamina and the, the asceticism and the self-sacrifice uh, to achieve uh, greatness. One of the things that a, uh, a lecturer at Gonzaga, uh, Bernard Lonergan, who some of you have heard about, uh, I'm sure, uh, 20th century theologian and philosopher, uh, Jesuit theologian and philosopher. Uh, one of the things he challenged uh, those doing theology to is to be attentive to religious experience. And he said, only in the climate of religious experience that our thinking about God flourishes. And so uh, the aim of the lecture tonight is to ask something like, what might a desire for God look like in a secular age? And how might we think theologically about such desire? All right, a desire for God, a desire for holiness, with attention uh, to concrete examples of religious experience. Just briefly said, uh, this idea of the desire for God, a brief note on the desire for God in the Catholic intellectual tradition. Now, there's all kinds of ink spilled uh, over these issues. But you know, bare bones in the Catholic intellectual tradition, uh, our desire for God is written on the human heart. All right? and, and from the Catholic perspective, even if you don't know it or think it or believe it, the human beings are created by God and for God. And only in God will we find uh, the truth and the happiness uh, that we search for, all right? And I think we, it's fair to say 
we all yearn, yearn for a good life, uh, for happiness, all right? Uh, to think of two quotes from Augustine. You know the quote from Augustine? Some of you read Confessions, you know, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. It's kind of the restless heart of Augustine. But also a little later, I think it's in book five, Augustine says, I sought you, O Lord, where you cannot be found. I sought you in the region uh, of death, all right? And so while we yearn and seek, uh, we often do so in ways that are distorted, and we try to seek uh, that kind of fulfillment in the things that really, in the end, uh, will not make us happy. And that's probably the story of all of our lives at some point, and it's the story of the human condition. Well, uh, this desire is, one way to think about it is to look at a couple human capacities, and that is our desire for meaning and truth, okay? The dynamism of your mind, all of, all of us, the questions we ask, all right, this yearning for truth says something about our orientation in the world toward God. And then also, uh, so knowledge, but also love, all right? The desire for an experience of love. And so in this lecture, uh, I'm gonna emphasize the latter. I'm gonna uh, concentrate more on uh, the experience of love. The desire for God in a secular age. Okay, well, uh, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I wanted to place uh, the kind of yearning of the human spirit in the context of what we call uh, the secular age. And that's uh, Charles Taylor's big book, The Secular Age. And uh, one of the professors in here, Tony, uh, has written a couple of nice pieces uh, this year, both an appreciation of Charles Taylor and, and also some provocative questions uh, to Charles Taylor. But, you know, what about, uh, the age we're in, okay, which is the fruit of many ways a decline of religious belief and practice. Practice. What about uh, probably even more? What hits home more to us is that uh, religious faith, all right, and ecclesial belonging is one contested option among many other options. Even those of us who believe and belong to a community are well aware, all right, through media and just the diversity around which we live of the of the variety of options out there. Okay, another element of the secular age, okay, at least maybe the dark side is this experience of the loss of meaning, all right, in a disenchanted world, a kind of experience, experience of flatness, all right, of, of living, kind of living on the, the treadmill of life, the rat race, all right, but very little off, often sort of stepping back and thinking about uh, the meaning of it all and where are we going. One of the things in Charles Taylor's book on the secular age is he highlights at the end in a chapter on conversions, uh, his version of, the, you might say, the saints. And those great, great saints and other holy figures who have navigated uh, the secular age, all right? The experience of unbelief, the experience of malaise, the experience of sorrow, the experience of being presented of many different options in life. All right, so I'm following along in that vein uh, this afternoon, and I want to look at two really very, very different people, okay, in some ways, uh, Therese of Lisieux and Eddie Hillison. In many ways, the French Carmelite and the Dutch spiritual seeker occupied different terrain in the 19th and 20th century spiritual landscape. Therese was reared in a French pious Catholic household with all of her surviving sisters entering cloistered religious life. Eddie was raised in a largely secular Jewish household, smattered with an eclectic mix of Christian, Jewish, philosophical, literary, and poetic influences. Therese lived as a celibate behind the walls of the Carmel. All right, she was a sister, a cloistered sister. Eddie lived in the heart of cultured Amsterdam, socialized in circles influenced by Jungian psychology, and engaged in her spiritual seeking in the context of an ongoing and very complicated sexual life. In fact, she considered herself, and I quote, accomplished in bed, just about seasoned enough to be counted among the better lovers, end quote. And yet there were also strike, uh, points of striking contact. Both achieved a level of spiritual maturity at a young age, meeting, their early, death, or meeting early deaths in their 20s. Both communicated to us through journals and letters. Both embody not so much a large political program of rooting out systematic injustice, 
but the little way of love alone. This is not to deny a connection between the contemplative life and public political significance. It's just to emphasize their mutual commitment to simplicity of life and daily contemplative practices. And it's that that fueled uh, their works of charity. And so there's a lot to be explored in these thinkers. And I thought I would set um, a kind of theoretical grounding all right, in Trinitarian theology, and then say more uh, about uh, each of their lives in connection uh, to one another. That is uh, an icon of Bernard Lonner Lonergan contemplating the Trinity right there. So imitation of the Trinity and a metaphysics of holiness. All right, I want to suggest uh, that holiness uh, in this context is a participation in an imitation of the divine relations. All right, a participation in an imitation of the divine relations. And so the idea that connected to that is that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God and are called to be uh, in the image of God and live in the image of God in history. All right, and to do so, uh, to be an imago dei in history is to uh, nurture an active reception of divine grace. All right, another way of thinking about it is to participate in a, in a mysterious way in the Trinitarian relations. Okay? Now, all right, some of these words might be new to some and maybe not new uh, to others, but I want to give, give you a feel for, this is language that comes largely out of uh, the tradition of uh, Thomas Aquinas, all right? And I'm building on uh, the work of Bernard Lonergan and some of his uh, interpreters uh, in this regard, Doran is one up there, to think about, okay, the Trinity, all right? Christians profess a triune God. And then, you know, how do we as human beings all right, this is an attempt to think through that idea. How do we as human beings participate uh, in, in the divine relations? All right, it sounds rather lofty and mysterious, which it is, all right? But also, you know, like Eddie and, and Therese, I think, will exhibit, all right? It can happen in the midst, uh, at least I suggest, the midst of our uh, daily lives. And for Therese, in many ways, a hidden life. Okay, so we have four uh, divine relations that I want to, point out, okay, the first two, active spiration and passive spiration on the left column are the most important uh, for this talk, all right? And this is the idea that in the Trinitarian relations that the Father and the Son breathe the Holy Spirit, okay? Spirate, breathe, breathe the Holy Spirit. All right, and the second one, passive spiration, is the Holy Spirit who is the preceding love of Father and Son. Maybe some of you read Augustine and heard similar language about the Holy Spirit as the preceding love of Father and Son. All right, and then we have paternity and filiation uh, as well. The top two are, are the, uh, the most important for, for this talk, okay? So I want to make one further connection. All right, so if the left column are human ways, you know, created human ways of participating in the divine relations. So sanctifying grace, the habit of charity, the indwelling of divine wisdom, all right, that's the incarnation, Christ, and the beatific vision, right, seeing God face to face. All right, I'm extending uh, one scholar, Neil Ormerod, who connects these human participation, these kinds of human participation in God, to particular forms of sanctity or holiness. All right, it's just a model. It's hard to separate one form of sanctity in little categories, but it's, it's something, it gives us something to hang our hats on and to, to think about. So sanctifying grace would be connected, uh, according to Ormrod, to a kind of simple sanctity. All right, this would be uh, the little way. This would be uh, receiving God, okay? Uh, you know, sort of receiving uh, the love of God, okay? The, the God who loves us. Uh, without conditions. Uh, the habit of charity would be 
sort of extending that reception of God's love, right? I mean, for lack of, for, I mean, to, to build the kingdom up in the world, okay? To love God and to love neighbor, okay? That's the habit of charity, at least the way I'm defining it uh, with the help of Lonergan and Dorn. All right, and this would be more of a, uh, if you think of uh, the little way as uh, a kind of quiet, uh, I don't know, a quiet form of sanctity, all right? Apostolic sanct sanctity would be more sort of building up the kingdom uh, in the world, you might say. And if Therese uh, embodies a kind of simple sanctity, uh, maybe with the habit of charity, the apostolic sanctity, we think of, I don't know, Ignatius Loyola, I come from the Jesuit uh, end of things, or Dorothy Day, somebody like that, okay? building up the kingdom uh, in the world, Oscar Romero, there are many others. Okay, so keep that in mind, this, this link between active spiration, sanctifying grace, tau calm, and simple sanctity, okay? All right, so the consoling, complacent love, the Im invitation to rest and be transformed, okay, being on the receiving end of God's unconditional love. <coughs> and second of all, passive spiration, the habit of charity, apostolic sanctity, and this is the habitual orientation of enacting God's love in the world, All right, Loving God with heart, mind, and soul and neighbor as ourselves, working for the kingdom, embracing the return of evil for good, those kinds of things. All right, so keep these two categories in mind as I continue. And I'm building on that the starting point for a kind of theological investigation, the kind of what I'm doing today, uh, is, uh, is active and passive inspiration as, as uh, realities that are universally uh, accessible, okay? In other words, that can be lived out certainly within the bounds of the church or the visible church, the visible boundaries of the church, but also uh, outside of the visible, visible boundaries of the church, which brings in, of course, Eddie Hillison, as I'll say in a little bit. And so a guiding question for me is what evidence is there that Therese and Hillison give incarnate meaning to sanctifying grace or simple sanctity and the habit of charity, apostolic sanctity. <coughs> right, Therese of Lisieux. <coughs> So mindful of those categories I laid out, I turn to perhaps the more interesting part uh, of the talk, and that's the, the lives of, of these two women. When Therese was born in 1873, her parents had already lost four of their children. There were five surviving children, and they were all girls, the youngest being Therese. Okay, four years later, her mother died of breast cancer at the age of 46, and her father moved his family to the town of the Sioux. Whereas Eddie Hillison experienced a largely secular upbringing sustained by eclectic philosophical and classic and religious sources, Therese was thoroughly Catholic, as I mentioned before. So contemplative life, right? Contemplative life and openness to the world. A full examin examination of her life and witness in the world, of course, would include all kinds of historical and biographical and even psychological analyses. But as Balthazar notes, Therese understood the act of total surrender to the triune God as the highest possible form of engagement on behalf of the world's salvation. It's pertinent to note uh, the fate of contemplation in the contemporary world. One can discern in many ways a widespread assault on silence and on contemplation. Right? And most of us are part of that assault, I would suggest. Openness to the world for Therese was more than a dialogue measured by practical goals and successes. Short-sighted posture ignored the deeper insight into the contemplatives. And that is this. Far from being a flight from the world, contemplative forms of life in the church take encounter between the world and the living God of Jesus Christ to its most radical point. That's a picture of Therese and her sisters. So the little way. One of the dominant images of Therese, okay, known technically as St. Therese of the Child of Jesus and the Holy Face, is the little flower. It seems to me, writes Therese, that if a little flower could speak, it would tell simply what God has done for it and without trying to hide its blessings. 
While the designation of little flower sounds sweet, it also can be interpreted as Therese's genius for sisterhood. Her way of placing herself as an equal in the midst of the masses of simple folk who will never be specifically noticed or acclaimed. Therese, of course, had intense desires to do great things and was tortured by these desires. It was only in the discovery of her vocation that this torture subsided. Her story reveals, as does Eddie Hillisom's, that when we come to rest in God, we become single-hearted creatures, but that this path to simplicity, all right, is often complex, torturous, fraught with painfully conflicting desires and dreams. The simple sanctity of the little way is a, is a constituent uh, dimension of Therese's contribution. The little way is a process, you might say, of demolition. It demolishes an obsession with performing great deeds. All right? It's a demolition of religious facades. The living flame of love sends the saints to spread the fire, not to be dampened by bourgeois Christianity. Therese was a fighter by nature, fearless, assertive, which explains her uh, devotion to, to Joan of Arc. When you often think of Therese, you don't think of Joan of Arc. All right? But she loved Joan of Arc, and she wrote poetry about Joan of Arc and even penned a play as well. Therese's battle was to rid Christianity of the temptation to assert one's own greatness. She was therefore skeptical of ascetical practices that aim merely at human, uh, human perfection, preferring spiritual childhood over religious greatness. Therese believes sanctity consists not in successfully performing great religious acts, but in being ready, and I quote her, to become small and humble in the arms of God, acknowledging in a radical way our own weaknesses and vulnerability, trusting in the goodness of God. In light of my emphasis on the interpersonal dimension of religious experience, it's pertinent to note that Therese's relationship with God was never uh, couched in legal language, all right, but it bore the marks of the interpersonal. To the average Christian, this love may seem a little overdone, if you've read uh, some Therese. To the unbeliever, it might seem a little childish. All right, to those, outstand, uh, those standing outside a relationship of love in general, this inner secret realm uh, seems somewhat incomprehensible. But if misunderstood, but even if misunderstood, lovers delight in roaming in such spaces. All right, and she was a lover. Therese's model of the little way constitutes a way. Okay, she's not Thomas Aquinas. She's not Elizabeth Ann Seton. But in another way, you can think of her way as the way, insofar as it's centered on, uh, on love, okay, which is the heart of Christianity. The little way demands not great action, but surrender and gratitude, okay, doing small things with great love. Therese possessed high aspirations, as you may know, uh, to be a warrior, all right, she even said she wanted to be a priest, an apostle, a doctor, a martyr, she hoped to uh, embark on apostolic missionary adventures around the world that led to her martyrdom, the kinds of things she read about in the great stories of the saints. But after meditating on 1 Corinthians 13, all right, the great med Paul's great meditation on love, she realized that heroic deeds are nothing without love. All right, remember the, the you know, I can hand over my body to be burned, but without love, I am nothing. All right, that uh, became a real living reality in her life. And so she discovered that her vocation uh, was to love. And that's the little way, and it's the little way that would be accessible uh, to all. All right, now, one thing that uh, one scholar points out is these two types of sanctity that I talked about, remember these kind of explanatory terms, active and passive spiration, are two aspects of the single divine procession of the spirit Okay, that proceeds from the Father and the Son. All right, and in other words, the, what I want to point out, the implication of that uh, is that um, Therese challenges us to think beyond the, con the contemplation-action uh, dichotomy. All right, if those two kinds of sanctity kind of separate that idea out, all right, again, uh, it's a kind of uh, false separation. In terms that resonate with being on the receiving end of God's love, 
Therese, practice, uh, her practice involved a complete surrender and openness uh, to, to the word of the Lord, reaching beyond all active prayer into a state of being held, of simply receiving, and finally of, of necessity, passing on to suffering and to passion. Therese offers us a demanding vision of fructifying contemplation. All right? It's very much, I mean, you might say, in a kind of Ignatian vein, a kind of contemplation uh, in action. All right, and this, this vision, contemplation in action, is shown, for example, when she was appointing, uh, when she was appointed uh, novice mistress, you know, head of the novices. All right, she, had, she was in management in Carmel. All right, so, uh, you know, what, what to do there? All right, it sounds like a very action oriented uh, position. All right, but she was taking on powers and on duties beyond, I mean, on, beyond her powers. And she says she did not sit down to work out a scheme for dividing her time between prayer and action. Instead, she devoted herself contemplatively to God. Quote, without leaving your arms, without even turning my head, I shall d distribute your precious gifts to the souls who come asking for food. And so Therese embodies an attitude that can't quite be described in terms of contemplation or action. Rather, I want to suggest, she transcends uh, that dichotomy and the all-embracing law of love, right, which governs both receptivity and fruitfulness, both Mary and Martha, all right? In fact, uh, she suggested that when she dies, that that's when she's going to be the most active, all right? Heaven is going to be the spot uh, for her missionary activity. Again, think of Joan of Arc, okay, someone on the move. The habit of charity, remember I had simple sanctity and the habit of charity, all right? The habit of charity, I want to offer... Uh, two examples uh, that suggest, you know, that kind of illustrate uh, Therese living out uh, the habit of charity. And one is her response to uh, sisters in the Carmel who, whom she despised. All right? All right? Now that happens, right? Okay? No matter wh whether we're in a religious community or not. All right? My, uh, my department chair says his goal this semester is to have less meetings because... Uh, as he says, as the saying goes in the Jesuits, uh, the more meetings, the more chance to annoy one another. All right, and you can imagine something similar going on, uh, even in the, the kind of holy context uh, of the Carmel. Well, um, you know, she was she was annoyed, and uh, she says, uh, you know, that love ought to be directed to those, especially those whom we have a kind of natural antipathy for. All right, for those. Uh, who ignore, ignore, uh, annoy us, and she says this. I'll quote her a little bit. I told myself that charity must not consist in feelings but in works. Then I set myself to doing for this sister what I would do for the person I love the most. Each time I met her, I prayed to God for her, offering him all her virtues and merits. I felt this was pleasing to Jesus, for there is no artist who doesn't love to receive praise for his works. And Jesus, the artist of souls, is happy when we don't stop at the exterior, but penetrating into the inner sanctuary where he chooses to dwell, we admire its beauty. I wasn't content simply with praying very much for this sister who gave me so many struggles, but I took care to render her all the service possible. And when I was tempted to answer her back in a disagreeable manner, I was content with giving her my most friendly smile and with changing the subject of conversation. All right, so there's Therese with a little uh, life advice. All right, second, Therese willingly feasted what they call the, the table of sorrow. All right, and if that, the other example was a little bit, you know, the kind of, not mundane, but the, the real challenge of like daily life, right? All right, and kind of getting along in community. All right, but she also experienced a kind of dark night of the soul. And if you only have a limited under, knowledge of Therese, you may not know. Uh, her, about her, her experiences here, all right? She experienced the, the night, and the night was integral, right, to her mission and her charity to unbelievers, all right? A desire for God in a secular age, as I just mentioned. In some ways, Therese uh, dwells in the midst of uh, a secular age. She, she comes to the conclusion, she says, that there are actually people out there who don't believe in God, all right? Uh, and, of course, we, that doesn't sound all that shocking, right? to us because we live in a, an age with many options. Um, but she came to that. Now, uh, during the Easter, Easter of, 19, or of 18, 1986, 1896, 
after the Good Friday, when she had all these experiences of spitting the blood, God showed her, as she interprets the experience, that there really are people who have no faith, as I just mentioned. And here's Therese. He permitted my soul to be invaded by the thickest darkness, and that the thought of heaven up until then, so sweet to me, be no longer anything but the cause of struggle and torment. This trial was to last not a few days or a few weeks. It was not to be extinguished until the hour set by God himself, and this hour has not yet come. One would have to travel through, through this dark tunnel to understand its darkness. Okay? One of the fundamental points about the habit of charity uh, is, th is that she learns that charity isn't always a feeling, okay? but it's an act of the will. And in the midst of all these feelings of darkness, she begs for mercy for her unbelieving brothers and resigns herself to sit with these poor sinners, as she calls them, at the table filled with bitterness. And I quote Therese again. When I want to rest my heart weary of the surrounding darkness by the memory of the luminous country after which I aspire, my anguish only increases. It seems as if the darkness echoing the voices of sinners is mocking me, saying, you dream of light, of a fragrant homeland. You dream that you will possess the creator of these wonders for all eternity. You believe that you will one day emerge from this gloom. Go on, look forward to death, which will give you not what you hope, but a still darker night, the night of nothingness. All right, so she imagined this voice uh, ridiculing her. All right, and so there's a real uh, deep spiritual anguish that Therese experienced. Though there is still debate over the precise nature of her dark night, most scholars suggest that Therese probably experienced significant subjective desolation without technically losing her faith. Therese understood herself as standing among the sinners, no longer separated in any way from their condition, experiencing the fullness of alienation from God. Eddie Hillison, the thinking heart of the barracks. If Therese of Lisieux is accessible through her profoundly yet challenging little way, Eddie Hillison is for con some contemporary seekers perhaps even more accessible. Her vivacious demeanor, her erotic pursuits and struggles, her rearing in a house gifted with intellectual and artistic talent, and yet complicated by mental illness, and her spiritual pluralism make her even more relatable to many sojourners in the secular age. Born in the Netherlands in 1914, Eddie, an assimilated Dutch Jew, was the oldest of four children. They were middle class, a socially well-established family. All right, they were part of the ethnic Jewish community, but didn't participate in uh, Jewish religious practices. All right, she respected her father, and she had much in common with him, but she did not share the skepticism which kept him from social contracts and denominational organizations. His intellectual attitude of situating himself above mundane reality characterized, to him, characterized him to the end of his life. Her mother was unbalanced and difficult. All right? Normally, that's the mother-in-law. All right? But the mother was unbalanced and difficult, extroverted, domineering. And Eddie shared a, little, uh, kind of a lot of the tonality of her mother's life. All right? She was well aware of her mother's shortcoming. Uh, and she even remarked once that, my mother should be a model of what I must never become. All right? And yet I think she was really, they were really a lot alike. Um, her brothers, Yap and Misha, were both talented and emotionally disturbed. One brother suffered from schizophrenia. Uh, and the other, a very promising uh, pianist in Europe, was hospitalized, hospitalized for a time with psychotic episodes. And so uh, we see in Eddie's journals all right, experiences of inner fragmentation and depression and immobility and sleeping for long stretches at a time. All right, experimenting with self-medication, -medic experiencing moments of physical and eternal, uh, internal fatigue, mood swings, and the like. When she was in uh, Amsterdam, um, she was uh, working as a Russian tutor. All right, and her life in Amsterdam re revolved around two communities. All right, the community where she lived. Uh, Hans uh, the Grief, and Julius Speer, a, young, uh, a Jungian uh, psychologist. She had, um, at different times, uh, intimate relationships uh, with both of the men 
And uh, the one, uh, the relationship with Julius Spear was the most transformative and captivating uh, for her. For her, but you know, uh, now the relation to now, I mean, maybe always, but now, so especially now, would uh, the relationship would be thought of as pretty? Uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, not good or uh, uh, not not suggested, you know. So uh, as part of his therapeutic method, Spear would engage in uh, eroticized wrestling mass matches with his patients, all right, which were not supposed to lead to intercourse, all right. Uh, Eddie's chronicling of his kisses and touches and casual liberties, all right, strike, as, strike us, I think, is highly incorrect, all right, and I think rightly so, uh, but some, you know, scholars have suggested that some of this was not uncommon during the interwar period, uh, where there were eclectic psychoanalytic experiments and adventures and uh, self-exploration, all right, but nevertheless, this was Eddie's life. And uh, she was seduced and, and riven by her desires, and she had romantic yearnings, uh, but also uh, this desire for independence. And uh, the, her journals attest to that uh, kind of tension. But I think in the end, what we see in her journals is this movement uh, away uh, from a kind of urgent eros all right, of the erotic uh, to closer to something like selfless, selfless agape. OK. Now. Some have suggested that uh, we ought not jump and characterize Eddie Hillison as a kind of crypto Christian right away, all right, uh, as many have been inclined to do. Her influences are many Dostoevsky, Adler, Jung, Augustine, the Bible, Rilke, the poet, all right? And I, I take that, that critique seriously, not to sort of easily slap a Christian label uh, on somebody, but I, but I take an alternative approach, which is. Uh, if God is at work uh, in the world, all right, can we not at least attempt to discern uh, vestiges of the Trinity all right, in the lives of, of human beings uh, and even a life as complicated as uh, Eddie Hillison? All right, so I draw on uh, John Paul II. The Holy Spirit offers everyone the possibility of sharing in the Paschal mystery in a manner known to God. And Benedict XVI, interestingly enough, uh, his Ash Wednesday homily, uh, or his Ash Wednesday homily right before he announced his resignation, all right, wrote about Eddie. Uh, and he, he talks about Augustine and Paul and people who have undergone conversion, conversions, but he said, Eddie is someone to turn to in a secular age, in an age when uh, in some ways uh, the religious has been eclipsed, the sacred has been eclipsed. And we find in her, and this is Benedict, in her disrupted, restless life, she found God in the very midst of the great tragedy of the 20th century, the Shoah. This frail and dissatisfied young woman, transfigured by faith, became a woman full of love and inner peace who was able to declare, and I quote, I live in constant intimacy with God. And so, um, um, briefly, I'll say something about the little way of Eddie, okay, and also... Uh, the habit of charity uh, in Eddie, the same way I did with um, Therese of the Sioux. As time progressed in Eddie's life and as the Jewish situation in Amsterdam worsened, Eddie developed a more intimate, loving relationship with God. We witness a transition from her speaking of God in the third person to an I thou encounter. In one letter to a friend, she wrote, you have made me so rich, O God, please let me share out your beauty with open hands. My life has become an uninterrupted dialogue with you, O God, one great dialogue. Sometimes when I stand in some corner of the camp, tears, tears sometimes run down my face, tears of deep emotion and gratitude. But when I lie in bed and rest in you, O God, tears of gratitude run down my face. And so uh, this loving rest in God, all right, this simple sanctity emerges as Eddie matures in her spiritual life in the midst of horrific circumstances. One of the images that we constantly get in her journals is the image of kneeling. Eddie de described herself as the girl, originally, the girl who could not kneel, all right, the girl who could not kneel, but who later would become, she calls, a kneeler in training 
And she says this, the girl who could not kneel but learned to do so on the rough coconut matting in an untidy bathroom. Such things are often more intimate than even sex. The story of the girl who gradually learned to kneel is something I would have to write in, a fullest, uh, in the fullest possible way. And so the language of thou and kneeling and love and intimacy is profound. And she had an experience, interestingly enough, with 1 Corinthians 13, all right? The same passage uh, that I brought up with Therese. And Eddie says this about that upon reading it and meditating on it. It worked on me like a divining rod that touched the bottom of my heart, causing hidden sources to spring up suddenly within me. All at once, she adds, I was down on my knees beside the little white table and all my released love coursed through me again, purged of desire, envy, spite, and so on. Again, as her relationship progressed, uh, Hillisum uh, began to be attentive to the present moment facing death, one of the great at atrocities. She says this, life is difficult. In the past, I would chaot live chaotically in the future because I refused to live in the here and now. I wanted to be handed everything on a platter like a, bald, a badly spoiled child. Sometimes I had the certain, if rather undefined feeling that I would make it one day, that I had the capacity to do something extraordinary. And at other times, the wild fear that I would go to the dogs after all. I now realize why. I simply refused to do what needed to be done, what lay right under my nose. I refused to climb into the future one step at a time. Okay, so uh, that's one of the themes uh, I wanna suggest in the midst of that, she, in the midst of like laying in her bed, hearing bombs in the background, she would reflect on the gift and the beauty uh, of life, all right, in the midst of uh, the threat. And so um, just like Therese, Hillison uh, reveals an ongoing uh, process of pruning herself of this desire for greatness. Remember the demolition of great deeds? All right. Uh, and instead orienting herself to the little things. Okay. So here's another quote from Eddie. Wash your hands. She's talking to herself. Wash your hands of all attempts to embody those great sweeping thoughts. The smallest, most fatuous little essay is worth more than the flood of grandiose ideas in which you like to wallow. The subject right before you is more important than those prodig prodigious thoughts on Tolstoy and Napoleon that occurred to you in the middle of last night. And the lesson you gave that keen young girl on Friday night is more important than all your vague philosophizings. Never forget that. Don't overestimate your own intensity. It may give you the impression that you are cut out for greater things than the so-called man in the street whose inner life is a closed book to you. All right, so she's talking to herself there. All right, and um, as, as her, as she begins to get closer to, as the Nazis begin to take over life uh, in Amsterdam, she says this, she says, sometimes I long for a convent cell with the sublime wisdom of centuries set out on bookshelves all over the wall. And there I would immerse myself in the wisdom of the ages. Then I might perhaps find peace and clarity, but that would be no great feat. It is right here in this very place, in the here and the now that I must find them. And so um, when she translated Russian, she says, I must write another Brothers Karamazov, like Dostoevsky, all right? But then she reflects uh, that all I need to do is to be, to live, and to try to be a little more human, to accumulate knowledge, okay? And she asks uh, God instead for the knowledge, and I quote, the knowledge that leads to wisdom and true happiness uh, that leads, and the kind, uh, I'm sorry, knowledge that leads to happiness and wisdom and not the kind that leads to power. All right, one more theme that I want to mention, and then I know I'm running out, I'm out of time. And that is uh, the habit of charity. All right, and especially uh, with regard to returning evil uh, with good. All right, Eddie Hillisum wanted to be a balm of, con or Trez wanted to be a balm of consolation. Eddie Hillisum says she wanted to be a balm for all wounds and to be the thinking heart uh, of the barracks. Okay, uh, many of the, uh, the reflections that I offer in this segment of uh, the lecture have to do with uh, the, the Nazis uh, taking over. Uh, but she volunteered Eddie to be sent to the transit camp at Westerbork, all right? 
And what, what this uh, entailed, she didn't have to go. She worked for the Jewish council. She could skirt her way out of it, but she wanted to go. And it entailed living on the campsite and in an environment of cramped and noisy quarters, hospital and prison barracks, deprivation of food and food shortages, uh, illness, lack of hygiene, constant company of death. And it's in the midst of that that she uh, began to nurture a deep prayer life. All right. Now, uh, one scholar critiques her, and he says uh, that she was too passive. All right. What she did is uh, she began to uh, try to root out hatred in her own heart, especially hatred for all Germans. She says, uh, we ought to think of also the mothers of the Germans who are also crying and in tears out of loss. And she treats with Nazi guards. All right. Uh, you know, she said to one, what, did your girlfriend break up with you today, uh, the way you're acting? All right. She's a humorous uh, kind of woman. But uh, she talks about uh, the kind of uh, evil uh, and disorderedness that crosses all of our human hearts. And uh, her, her response to evil was in many ways a kind of nonviolence response, okay, and uh, the response of not uh, fighting uh, evil with evil, but to fight uh, evil with love. And uh, in that way, uh, somebody like Todorov, a scholar facing the extreme, says, I would really love to be around her. I'd love to be friends with her. She seems like a great lady, but I cannot recommend her to the downtrodden of the earth because he saw a kind of passivity uh, in her that uh, he could not recommend. And I want to suggest that I think Eddie still uh, offers us a legitimate uh, mode of responding uh, to evil. All right. Now, not everybody did that. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer discerned that it was legitimate to assassinate Hitler. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Christian theologian. All right. But Eddie herself chose the little way of love, returning uh, evil uh, with good, uh, evil with love. And I have some quotes up here uh, from Eddie on uh, not getting caught up uh, in the cycles of violence, which very evident in her time and also uh, evident uh, throughout uh, human history, okay? And the last quote there, do not relieve your feelings through hatred. Do not seek to be avenged on all German mothers for they too sorrow at this very moment for their slain and murderous sons. All right, um, I end the paper, but I'll end there, but I do end the paper with a little section on uh, the movement from uh, the heavily erotic to, uh, to agape. Uh, in, in Eddie Hillison, and that it was somehow her experience of passion, I think, opened her up uh, to a deep compassion, all right? And it gives me hope for all of us uh, in life. So that's been my uh, work today, to think through these Trinitarian realities in the very uh, short and broken yet fascinating lives of Therese and Eddie. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Um, some of you know me already. My name is John Laracy. Uh, I teach in the religion department here at Seton Hall. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity um, from the Lonergan Institute. Thank you, Monsignor, Lydia, and Greg. Um, I, you know, I actually, I got the chance to read Randy's book, uh, The Givenness of Desire. And it, it's, a, it's a very fine book. Um, and you know, one of the things I loved about the book was uh, the way Randy brought Bernard Lonergan into dialogue with um, a number of theologians, right? So the dialogical aspect of the book was, 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 was great. And in particular, you know, I'm, my, I'm a scholar of Baltazar. That's, that's my main subject, uh, my main uh, specialty. So you know, he used Baltazar, and in particular on this subject, Threads of Lazou. So this is nice that this is actually an opportunity to continue this dialogue. Um, now, uh, Randy's lecture is titled, The Desire for God in a Secular Age. And you know, I'm kind of responding also to Randy's book, not just the lecture. And you know, in Randy's book, it seemed to me, uh, the, main, you know, kind of the main question is, in what sense do we humans have a, a, a basic desire for God? You know? um, and then, it, you know, using Lonergan, it seemed you know, kind of 
what, what happens is, you know, when we receive grace, we fall in love with God. You know, and so Lonergan, Lonergan talks about being in love with God. And um, after reading Randy and reading Lonergan, I was left with this question of um, what, what does this mean, being in love with God? And just kind of a simple question, but, but a profound question. Um, so what I want to do in my comments here, you know, I want to ask, uh, you, know, um, the, you know, I want to ask this question. What does it mean to be in love, to be in love with God, and just to be in love in general? You know, and, how, and, and then how does this state of being in love, how does it relate to desire? So I think what I'm doing is, what I'm trying to do, and I don't know if ultimately, you know, Randy you know, will agree, but what I, I'm, I'm trying to kind of draw out an implication of, in Randy's argument. And it's namely, this is the implication, this is it, that love is more than desire, although it always includes desire. Right? And love is more than intellect, but it always is intellectual in the full sense. When you're talking about love in the full sense, it, is, it includes desire, it includes intellect, but it's something, it's something more. Uh, it, it, love involves all the faculties of the person at once. So I want to briefly reflect on love in this sense, and what I want to say is, you know, love in this full sense is a response to beauty, primarily. And you know, when, when, I, when I, I saw that you're speaking on these two figures, I, I saw, thought this was perfect. I mean, it's really, this, I, this claim is exemplified in these two figures. And you know, what I'll conclude with, the concluding idea is, I suspect that understanding love as a response to beauty is, is really the key to recovering an awareness of desire for God. So let me first uh, turn to Therese of Lisieux. Right, and, and I'm drawing on Balthazar, and Randy does too. Um, her, you know, her little way of love, it, it begins with a response of self-surrender, right? As Randy said, a response of self-surrender to God's love, right? God's infinite love. As it, enc it encompasses her, she experienced that, that the love is encompassing her. And, you know, Balthazar would say what's going on here is the primary object of her love is God's own glorious love. Right? And he would emphasize it's glorious, right? And, and he would say it's analogous to natural beauty, right? It, it's both good, it's desirable, we want it, but it's also intelligible, it's understandable. It's both at once. You know, so Balthazar would say, in, in, in Therese's case, her love is primarily a response to, to the beauty of the other. And when you're talking about God, you're talking about the glory of the other. And so to love in this sense is simultaneously all at once to know, delight in, and desire the beloved. And I'd want to emphasize delight, right? Delight in, delight in the one who is given to me but remains other and more than me. And, you know, when I was writing this, I thought I, I was, uh, this, the thought came to me. Uh, I was very excited about this. I don't know if you will be, but <laughs> in, in, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, all three, I think. Uh, God the Father speaks two times in each gospel, and it's during a theophany, a revelation of God's glory, trying glory. And both times the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I delight. Uh, so it's, this is the glorious love of the Trinity that comes to meet Therese of Lisieux in the crucified and risen Jesus. And she joyfully, you know, after her conversion that you spoke of, Randy, she joyfully rests in this love. It's a joyful rest. She, she rests in her beloved Christ. She desires to know him more and more, right? But, you know, this is kind of the key point. The key point is because she's received the love in Jesus, her de the desire itself, right, because it, the love is already given, the desire itself is so peaceful, serene, joyful, generous. So the point is that by contemplating God's glory, the, right, the, this unbounded love in awe and wonder, she can accept her own littleness, her own finitude as a gift. And, and, and the suffering, the darkness you were speaking of, even that, right? Because, because she's, this, this love, is, this, this gift has been fully given, she, she, can, she can face this darkness. And then uh, the example you gave, Randy, of uh, the sister she didn't like, yeah. you know? Um, what strikes me about that in relation to my point here is she, she focuses on the beauty of the sister, and that allows her to love focusing on the beauty, the unique gifts that the sister has. 
Now, let me turn to Eddie uh, Hillison. Now, she's not Christian, but nevertheless, I see a similar form of love in her. Right? As, as Randy explained in the lecture and in his book, right, she was participating in this kind of, I guess you could say, sophisticated psychoanalytic uh, culture. Um, and she's clearly, at this time in her life, an intellectual seeker. She's an erotic lover, right? She's an accomplished lover, she says. Uh, but I would want to say, you know, her desire is not fulfilled. It's not fulfilled. And think of those wrestling matches you talked about, about the kind of frustration that's involved there. So it seems to me that what happens with her, her conversion, right? Her conversion, it takes the form of, the, of a dawning awareness of the beautiful, or we might say glorious, gift of existence, right? And I think you could describe her as a mystic of beauty. And, you know, it's, I have a quotation I want to read here that, that Randy didn't use. I'm happy. But you, you used some amazing quotations, including one where she, she speaks – when she's in the Nazi prison camp, and she speaks explicitly of God's beauty and resting in that. Um, so now I'm going I'm to quote her journal. And this is – before she was in the prison camp, uh, she, but she was – you know, it was already during the Nazi pers persecution. And she writes, I find life beautiful and I feel free. The sky within me is as wide as the one stretching above my head. I believe in God, and I believe in man, and I say so without embarrassment. And then she goes on to say, kind of, now we get to an ethical component, right? The, 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 the ethics, the, the ethical um, love that flows from her, her, her delight in God. And she says, true peace will come only when every individual finds peace within himself, when we have all vanquished and transformed our hatred for our fellow human beings of whatever race, even into love one day. Although perhaps that is asking too much. I mean, of course, because she's dealing with the Nazi. It is, however, the only solution. So notice how her desire for universal peace flows from this serene contemplation of the, the beauty of existence, its givenness. So she sees in herself, right? She speaks of her in the, inside of herself, God's in her. She sees in herself and her fellow creatures something beautiful, intrinsically. Intrinsically beautiful, even if we act evil. And, and, and so something worthy of love. And thus, she even dares to forgive her persecutors. And I, what, I want to, what I would want to argue is that, you know, you can argue this philosophically, that this is, this is perfect human love, right? You know, what is perfect human love? It's contemplative delight in an ongoing desire for the creator's infinitely generous love. And that's how, that's how she, her, her love for, for her enemies can be so, you know, that's how she can love her enemies. Uh, now, in light of her example, I want to make a suggestion. I mean, it's maybe too much to talk about, but I just want to you know, propose this, that authentic human love, right? Just, you know, even philosophically, authentic human love is already a tacit love of God. And, you know, what I'm, I'm saying it's a tacit love of God, not just a desire for God, but love in the full sense that we've been talking about. And I'm really glad, Randy, that you said, you know, with the, with the lecture that you focused on this, the experience of love, you know? So the point would be this. Every time we humans perceive, affirm, and desire the beauty of someone or something, right? and every time we're willing to preserve that beauty, to, to give of ourselves, sacrifice ourselves, to preserve the beauty of, of, of someone else or something else, we're loving the gift of the creator because we're affirming the intrinsic good of the other, even if they're evil. So the point is genuine love receives oneself and others as a, a gift of boundless love. It doesn't set limits on it, on love. And, you know, so I would want to say, it's a, you, know, e, you know, even if you're not aware of it, if you're truly loving in this full sense, then, then this is a love for the creator, the infinitely uh, loving source. Now, in Randy's book, though, you still have to say from a Christian perspective, uh, you know, the point of the part of the point of the book, and I would agree, is that the gift of grace in Jesus Christ is still something more. There's still a desire for more.
for an eternal sharing God's own inner love. And that's through Jesus Christ. So that's kind of the, the theology, theological point I want to make now to kind of uh, transition to questions. Um, you know, I, I was kind of, uh, you know, to, to try to make this concrete, I was thinking about how this, you know, how might we um, bring this to bear on the cultural situation. And, and Randy referenced uh, Charles, Secular, uh, Charles Taylor, A Secular Age. And he speaks of the malaise of modernity, the malaise. And, you know, I kind of wanted to address this. And, and so let me raise a few questions and then a proposal. You know, my main question is this. Do, you know, does desire, right, the individual's desire, does it become acquisitive when it's detached from love in the full sense? In other words, does desire become a desire to possess merely for oneself, right? And then it's unsatisfying. You can never satisfy it. And at least this malaise. And Randy, you're very aware of this in your book, this, this issue, because you, yeah. with the, uh, the dialogue with Rene Girard. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so as Randy points out in his book, uh, the rapacious desire is a problem in the consumer economy, right? Where this is this, this grasping desire that's unfulfilled, it's never fulfilled. And I'm also, I'm also wondering this, um, this is something for academics to consider. I'm wondering if even the desire to know can become destructive apart from love for beauty, for, the, for love of being. And, you know, for example, it seems to me that um, if, you know, if you take the hard sciences, if you detach them from a love of the being, the love, the love of beauty, uh, it, they, they can become destructive in their quest to know. You know, and, and the desire for um, unimpeded technological pro pro uh, progress can, can become destructive if it's detached from love in this full sense. So what I'm wondering is if in response to this malaise of modernity, if um, what we need to recover is you know, human love, a basic sense of love, uh, you know, recovery of wonder before nature, right? So a kind of contemplative approach to science, um, a recovery of contemplative work, a recovery of art forms that are genuinely beautiful, right? Not just provocative, but genuinely beautiful. And, you know, most concretely, a recovery of, of interpersonal love in, in communities and family. And it, so it seems to me that, uh, in order, you know, if we're going to awaken this desire for God, uh, we have to first awaken this, this love that I'm, that I'm talking about. And I think this is an implication of your, of your uh, thesis. So I guess that's my question is just um, the kind of maybe one of the questions we can take up is, um, you know, mustn't desire be understood or, or um, mustn't de desire for God be grounded in kind of a, a human love. Thank you. That's great. Greg, do, do you want me to respond to anything? Or? Yeah, why don't you respond to John Just, and take a few questions. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, John. Um, really, really helpful uh, reflections. And uh, a lot to a lot to think about. I mean, so maybe I'll just respond uh, to a few things. One is, uh, I think your highlighting of love and beauty, uh, I think, is really important. And if anything, I th in the book, probably got shortchanged uh, in speaking of the uh, desire for God. I think things are there, and I think you helpfully, uh, generously, really bring bring that out. Uh, Therese talking about. Uh, Jesus as the like seeing the beauty in the person she didn't like. Jesus, the artist of souls, you know, respecting uh, the art. Uh, of course, in some ways, I'm like, yeah, that's obvious, that's beauty. But it, but it has you you drew up the, I think the implications uh, a little more, uh, and I really uh, appreciated that. Um, and also, uh, more than I emphasized in this lecture, the beauty. Uh, how, how important beauty is to Eddie Hillison, uh, especially that quote uh, that you had mentioned. I remember that even when I was talking about with Therese, like lovers delight to roam in those spaces, uh, the quote that you gave from Eddie, there was a similar kind of like expansive uh, notion uh, that I found. And, that, and that's happening in the midst of the camps, or in the midst of uh, under threat. So I, I love the... Uh, uh, this idea, the theophany. I'm excited about your uh, insight. Uh, the, the beloved son, the delight, the joyful uh, kind of rest. 
I mean, it's really interesting, like with, with Aquinas, when he first talks about love, I mean, love is a form of rest, right? It's, it's a kind of complacency, not in a bad sense, but in the sense that like, you know, when you first start dating somebody, all right, what do you want to do? You want to impress, you want to, you know, you're not at rest. You're like, you know, how do I hide the worst parts of myself uh, in order to, but when you really love, and that's what I, when I met my wife, it's kind of like, like when I could just like be and rest and relax at rest, there's something that interpersonal dimension uh, that you talked about, I think is really a rich part of the tradition of love as a form of rest compared to what you had just mentioned, uh, the way that, uh, well, you were, I'm thinking of power right now, uh, or of, uh, you were talking about the, the dangers of even knowledge becoming, what did you say, knowledge disconnected uh, from love? Yeah. Intellectual desire. Yeah, In- intellectual love. desire disconnected from love, I think is an important uh, point. I mean, it would be something like what the philosophers talk about is like instrumental rationality, right? I mean, sort of reason with a program to kind of dominate, all right, or the technological domination or whatever we want to say. Uh, the philosopher Jean-Luc Marion talks about love or talks about philosophy losing its first name, right? What does the word philosophy mean? Do you break it down? Love yeah, love of wisdom, right? So uh, losing its first name, and namely love, all right? That uh, the root of philosophy is it's not just wisdom, but it's the love of wisdom, the, the desire for wisdom, the yearning of wisdom. And I think you're also right to make a distinction between desire, you might say, and a fuller uh, sense of love, uh, you know, a kind of desire is a kind of yearning, all right, for completion or wholeness or whatever, or for, for the beyond. But uh, what I try to do today, as you point out, is to go into some of these deeper uh, dimensions of love in the fullest sense of the term, which involves uh, human beings being authentic lovers, all right, in relation to uh, the God who is love, and then breaking. Uh, and so behind the kind of throwing out some of these explanatory terms, spiration and those things, is to try to get at um, love in the fullest uh, sense of the term. So I think uh, uh, I walk away with uh, the, the beauty thing uh, and to highlight uh, the experiences of love and in the interpersonal community, authentic love, and sort of in the face of uh, the malaise of modernity, as you talked about, or the kind of imminent feelings of flatness um, and uh, in, in, in the secular age. Uh, so I walk away with uh, I think to take away some of those points from uh, your response and uh, I think that is all I'll say for now unless I think about the thing so thank you <laughs>